So last minute revision again, here are 100 quick fire C2 revision questions. Um, I'm going to do them chunk by chunk, so if you want to try the questions before I show you the answers, um, pause now and um, you can have a go at them. So um, I'm going to draw you a little picture for this um, because this is the way that I like um, things done. I like little pictures. So protons are here in the nucleus. Neutrons are also in the nucleus. And the electrons when the shell's outside. Protons have a mass of one. Neutrons have a mass of one. Electrons have a mass of zero. Protons have a charge of plus one. Neutrons have a charge of um, zero, and electrons have a charge of minus one. Um, so I'll just write that out nice and neatly for you so you can see it a bit better. So what type of bonding is it between a metal and a non-metal that is ionic? Between two metals it is covalent. So bonding in NaCl, we have sodium with one electron in its outer shell, chlorine with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons in its outer shell. Um, I'll just do it down here. We need some square brackets. We need a positive charge. Square bracket Cl minus charge and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this electron here has gone over here. For the bonding in magnesium oxide, we have magnesium group two, so it has two electrons in the outer shell. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, and five, six electrons in its outer shell. Magnesium loses those two electrons, so it becomes a two plus charge. Oxygen gains the two electrons so that it has eight electrons in its outer shell and gets a two minus charge. Um, for water, it is a covalent bonding, so hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. Oxygen, I'm going to do these with dots, has six electrons in its outer shell. Um, and it's helpful if you can remember that oxygen uh, looks like this, because that will just help you um, a little bit when we uh, draw dot and cross diagrams. That's water. Now for ammonia, so again, hydrogen has one electron, nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five electrons, and it helps if you know that nitrogen's shape is like this. Most of the time in the exam, they will actually give you um, a scaffold to help you draw covalent um, molecules. But I'm mean, so I don't. Okay, so 16, let me use the, the periodic table, that is the um, group number. So the group that it's in will tell you how many electrons are in the outer shell. What is a compound that is two or more different elements chemically bonded together. So a mixture is um, lots of different things all bonded, not bonded together. And an element is something that's going to be pure, that's going to be on the periodic table. Um, an iron is something that is either gained or lost electrons. So it's going to have a positive or a negative charge. So how many elements are there in CaCO3? We have calcium, we have carbon, and we have oxygen. So the answer is three. How many atoms do we have? 
we have one calcium, one carbon, and one, two, three oxygen. So the answer there is five. Uh, how many elements in magnesium oxide? We have uh, magnesium, we have oxygen and hydrogen, and we have three again. How many atoms in magnesium hydroxide? We have one magnesium, we have two oxygens, we have two hydrogens, so again, that is five. What well, is the formula of sulfate iron? This is on your periodic table. You don't have to remember this, but I put it on there because it's really important that you are at least familiar with these things. So sulfate is SO42 minus carbonate is CO3 2 minus nitrate NO3 minus and hydroxide is OH minus. So many people come to the exam and don't realise that these formulas are actually on the formula sheet. Um, so that's why I put the questions in to point it out to you. You don't have to remember them, you do get um, told them. So in ionic bonding, it's the transfer of electrons. Uh, list four simple molecules. So the ones that you need to know are water, carbon dioxide, um, ammonia, and methane. And it's handy if you can be um, familiar with the formulas of these, which is why I've written it that. So they're simple molecules because they have weak intermolecular bonds. These two giant covalent structures, both of these are made from uh, carbon, so they are diamond plus graphite. Why are they strong and um, why are they giant, why are they solid at room temperature solid is because they have strong bonds which take a lot of uh, energy to break. Give one giant ionic structure, sodium chloride, um, you can have any salt in there. Anything with a metal and non-metal well, sodium chloride is the one that we most commonly um, use. How do we make giant ionic structures conduct electricity? They need to be dissolved or molten. Next set of questions here. So what is the difference between pure metal and an alloy? Is that pure metal has oops. A pure metal has layers so that they can slide, and an alloy has no layers, so they can't slide. Really important words for you to get in there. Layers, slide, this is my alloy over here. No layers, no slide. And because the pure metal can slide, it means it's soft, and because the alloy doesn't have any layers and can't slide, it means it's really hard. So a shape memory polymer, and one that will regain its shape. And generally, this is after heating. What is the different structure between thermosetting and thermosoftening polymers? That is the cross links. How big are nano things? They are very small. Benefits of nanotechnology, um, sun cream, um, improved, and medicines. Uh, the possible risks that we don't know the long-term effects. How can we tell the mass of an element on the periodic table? Um, so, let me use the example of um, iron here, 56 and 26. The mass is the um, larger number out of the two on the periodic table, so this one up here. The number of protons, that is going to be the smaller number here. That is also the number of electrons. The number of neutrons is the mass minus the atomic number, and the atomic number is this one here. What is an isotope? So an isotope has a different number of neutrons. But the same number of um, protons and the same number of electrons. They could ask this as a three mark question, so uh, make sure you're hitting all those points by saying three things. How can we find the mass of a compound? Add all the masses together.
So um, here we need to find the mass of our calcium carbonate. So the mass of calcium is 40. Let me just check that. Yep, 40. The mass of carbon is 12. The mass of oxygen is 16. And we have three of those. Um, so we just need to pop all of those into our calculator to work out the mass. So the mass of calcium carbonate is 100. So again, we need to work out the mass here. Um, so the mass of magnesium is 24, plus mass of oxygen, which is 16, and we have two of those, plus the mass of hydrogen, which is, um, sorry, plus the mass of hydrogen, which is 1, and we have two of those as well. So pop all those into our calculator. 24 plus 16 plus 16 plus 2 equals 58. The mole is the molecular mass in grams. So you just take the mass and you just put a G after it. How do we find the percentage yield? That is... And that is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. Why might a reaction not give 100%? Because it is a reversible reaction. And um, that hasn't copied across my worksheet. That is a reversible reaction sign. What does chromatography do? It separates things out. so that we can see what's in there. Um, and how does GCM, G, GCMS separate things? It separates them by mass. What are the advantages of instrumental methods? It is fast, reliable, um, so what does S mean? Solid, liquid, Energy is a gas. Um, when you, what might you see where G is next to one of the products? You are going to see bubbles. So what might you see in a reaction where S is next to one of the products? That is going to go cloudy. How can we measure the rate of reaction um, a gas given off? Loads of different ways we can do this. We can um, collect a volume. Or we can count bubbles. How can we measure the rate of reaction of a precipitate being produced? That's it going to go cloudy, so we can see uh, that's generally the cross disappearing one. How does increasing the temperature affect the rate of reaction? That is going to increase it. How does increasing surface area affect the rate of reaction? Again, that's going to increase it. How does adding a catalyst affect the rate of reaction? That's going to increase it. How does decreasing the pressure affect the rate of reaction? That's going to decrease it. Decreasing the concentration is also going to decrease it. What is the smallest amount of energy needed to start a reaction? And that is the activation energy. What is a catalyst? So it's something that speeds up rate of reaction. Without getting involved. Or without changing. I'm um, giving an example um, of a use for a catalyst. So a catalytic converter in a car. That's a nice easy one to remember. Was well, an exothermic reaction that's something that feels hot, gives out energy. An endothermic reaction feels cold, takes in energy. Okay, last quarter here, which I make the solution acidic. Those hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions make it alkali. Oops, how do we draw a line best fit? That one's snuck in there, um, slightly out of order. Um, you're going to need to use a pencil, maybe a ruler, unless it's a curve. And we need to um, skip the anomalous points. So 
So what pH is acid? So that's going to be like low pH, so something around 1 um, to about 5. And then alkali, we're talking um, maybe like 8 up to 14. What colour is hydrated copper sulphate? That is blue and the anhydrous one is white. How can we change between the two of them? We can heat or add water depending on which way we're going. Um, what is produced when we mix um, an acid and a base? That is uh, salt and water. And an acid and a metal, that is going to be salt plus hydrogen. And the neutralisation reaction, this is an excellent one to learn because it comes up um, really quite often and you can get quite a lot of marks for that. Which acid produces chloride? So it's hydrochloric acid. Um, nitrates, that is uh, nitric acid. So last uh, little set of questions here. Which acid produces something sulfate? That is sulfuric acid. So towards which electrode will a positive ion move? It will move towards the negative electrode because opposites attract and the negative ions will move towards the positive electrode. Why won't electrolysis work on a solid? Because the ions need to move freely. What does cryolite do that reduces the um, melting temperature? of aluminium oxide. Um, what happens at the negative electrode? We are going to um, pick up electrons and at the positive electrode we are going to lose electrons. Um, what is reduction? Uh, reduction is that the uh, gain of electrons and oxidation is the loss you can remember it like this real big oxidation is a loss of electrons reduction is a gain of electrons in aluminium oxide why is this um, positive electrode made away because it is made of carbon that reacts with the oxygen to produce carbon dioxide which is a gas and just floats off into the air and um, what are the three products of brine electrolysis they are hydrogen chlorine and sodium hydroxide and why do we electroplate objects loads of different reasons um, but the one that I'm quite fond of is fuel and jewelry and are you going to do amazingly well in your DCSEs yes you are, because you've made it this far. Well done, guys. Excellent work. Thanks for watching. I really hope this is helpful. Subscribe so you don't miss any of my new videos. Share to help your friends get better grades. Any comments, corrections, questions or requests down below, please.